Alternative rock, also called alternative music, alt rock or simply alternative, is a style of rock music that emerged from the independent music underground of the 1970s and became widely popular in the 1980s. In this instance, the word alternative refers to the genre's distinction from mainstream rock music. The term's original meaning was broader, referring to a generation of musicians unified by their collective debt to either the musical style or simply the independent, DIY ethos of punk rock, which in the late 1970s laid the groundwork for alternative music. At times, alternative has been used as a catch-all description for music from underground rock artists that receives mainstream recognition, or for any music, whether rock or not, that is seen to be descended from punk rock including some examples of punk itself, as well as new wave, and post-punk. Although the genre evolved in the late 1970s and 1980s, music anticipating the sound of the genre can be found as early as the 1960s, with bands such as The Velvet Underground and artists such as Sid Barrett. Alternative rock broadly consists of music that differs greatly in terms of its sound, social context and regional roots. By the end of the 1980s, magazines and zines, college radio airplay, and word of mouth had increased the prominence and highlighted the diversity of alternative rock, helping to define a number of distinct styles and music scenes such as noise pop, indie rock, grunge, and shoegaze. Most of these subgenres had achieved minor mainstream notice and a few bands representing them, such as Husker Du and R.E.M., had even signed to major labels. But most alternative bands' commercial success was limited in comparison to other genres of rock and pop music at the time, and most acts remained signed to independent labels and received relatively little attention from mainstream radio, television, or newspapers. With the breakthrough of Nirvana and the popularity of the grunge and Britpop movements in the 1990s, alternative rock entered the musical mainstream and many alternative bands became successful. <laughs> <laughs> Origin of term In the past, popular music tastes were dictated by music executives within large entertainment corporations. Record companies signed contracts with those entertainers who were thought to become the most popular, and therefore who could generate the most sales. These bands were able to record their songs in expensive studios, and their works then sold through record store chains that were owned by the entertainment corporations, along with eventually selling the merchandise into big box retailers. The record companies worked with radio and television companies to get the most exposure for their artists. The people making the decisions were business people dealing with music as a product, and those bands who were not making the expected sales figures were then excluded from this system. Before the term alternative rock came into common usage around 1990, the sort of music to which it refers was known by a variety of terms. In 1979, Terry Tolkien used the term alternative music to describe the groups he was writing about. In 1979 Dallas radio station KZEW had a late-night new wave show entitled, Rock and Roll Alternative. College Rock was used in the United States to describe the music during the 1980s due to its links to the college radio circuit and the tastes of college students. In the United Kingdom, dozens of small do-it-yourself record labels emerged as a result of the punk subculture. According to the founder of one of these labels, Cherry Red, NME and Sounds magazines published charts based on small record stores called Alternative Charts. The first national chart based on distribution called the Indie Chart was published in January 1980. It immediately succeeded in its aim to help these labels. At the time, the term Indie was used literally to describe independently distributed records. By 1985, indie had come to mean a particular genre or group of subgenres rather than simply distribution status. The use of the term alternative to describe rock music originated around the mid-1980s. At the time, the common music industry terms for cutting-edge music were new music and postmodern, respectively indicating freshness and a tendency to recontextualize sounds of the past. 
Individuals who worked as DJs and promoters during the 1980s claim the term originates from American FM radio of the 1970s, which served as a progressive alternative to top 40 radio formats by featuring longer songs and giving DJs more freedom in song selection. According to one former DJ and promoter, somehow this term alternative got rediscovered and heisted by college radio people during the 80s who applied it to new post-punk, indie, or underground whatever music. At first the term referred to intentionally non-mainstream rock acts that were not influenced by heavy metal ballads, rarefied new wave, and high-energy dance anthems. Usage of the term would broaden to include new wave, pop, punk rock, post-punk, and occasionally college, indie, rock, all found on the American commercial alternative radio stations of the time such as Los Angeles KROQ-FM. Journalist Jim Gerr wrote that alternative also encompassed variants such as rap, trash, metal and industrial. In December 1991, Spin magazine noted, "...this year, for the first time, it became resoundingly clear that what has formerly been considered alternative rock, a college-centered marketing group with fairly lucrative, if limited, potential has in fact moved into the mainstream." The Bill of the First Lollapalooza, an itinerant festival in North America conceived by Jane's Addiction frontman Perry Farrell, reunited disparate elements of the alternative rock community, including Henry Rollins, Butthole Surfers, Ice T, Nine Inch Nails, Susie and the Banshees, and Jane's Addiction. That same year, Farrell coined the term alternative nation. In the late 1990s, the definition again became more specific. In 1997, Neil Strauss of the New York Times defined alternative rock as hard-edged rock distinguished by brittle, 70s-inspired guitar riffing and singers agonizing over their problems until they take on epic proportions. Defining music as alternative is often difficult because of two conflicting applications of the word. Alternative can describe music that challenges the status quo and that is fiercely iconoclastic, anti-commercial, and anti-mainstream. But the term is also used in the music industry to denote, the choices available to consumers via record stores, radio, cable television, and the Internet. However alternative music has paradoxically become just as commercial and marketable as the mainstream rock, with record companies using the term, alternative, to market music to an audience that mainstream rock does not reach. Using a broad definition of the genre, Dave Thompson in his book Alternative Rock cites the formation of the Sex Pistols as well as the release of the album's Horses by Patti Smith and Metal Machine Music by Lou Reed as three key events that gave birth to alternative rock. Until recent years early 2000s, when indie rock became the most common term in the U.S. to describe modern pop and rock, the terms indie rock and alternative rock were often used interchangeably, whilst there are aspects which both genres have in common, indie rock was regarded as a British-based term, unlike the more American alternative rock. Topic. Characteristics The name, alternative rock essentially serves as an umbrella term for underground music that has emerged in the wake of punk rock since the mid-1980s. Throughout much of its history, alternative rock has been largely defined by its rejection of the commercialism of mainstream culture, although this could be contested ever since some of the major alternative artists have achieved mainstream success or co-opted with the major labels from the 1990s onwards, especially since a new millennium and beyond. Alternative bands during the 1980s generally played in small clubs, recorded for indie labels, and spread their popularity through word of mouth. As such, there is no set musical style for alternative rock as a whole, although the New York Times in 1989 asserted that the genre is guitar music first of all, with guitars that blast out power chords, pick out chiming riffs, buzz with fuzzton and squeal in feedback. More often than in other rock styles since the mainstreaming of rock music during the 1970s, alternative rock lyrics tend to address topics of social concern, such as drug use, depression, suicide, and environmentalism. 
This approach to lyrics developed as a reflection of the social and economic strains in the United States and United Kingdom of the 1980s and early 1990s. Topic. History Topic Precursors 1960s and 1970s A precursor to alternative rock existed in the 1960s with the proto-punk scene. The origins of alternative rock can be traced back to The Velvet Underground and Nico 1967, by The Velvet Underground, which influenced many alternative rock bands that would come after it. We're Only In It For The Money by The Mothers Of Invention 1968, is considered by some to be an early alternative rock album. Artists such as Sid Barrett had influence on alternative rock in general. Cabaret Voltaire, The Monochrome Set, Swell Maps, Pop Group and Pill were alternative rock groups in 1970s. Topic, 1980s. By 1984, a majority of groups signed to independent record labels mined from a variety of rock and particularly 1960s rock influences. This represented a sharp break from the futuristic, hyper-rational post-punk years. Throughout the 1980s, alternative rock remained mainly an underground phenomenon. While on occasion a song would become a commercial hit or albums would receive critical praise in mainstream publications like Rolling Stone, alternative rock in the 1980s was primarily featured on independent record labels, fanzines, and college radio stations. Alternative bands built underground followings by touring constantly and by regularly releasing low-budget albums. In the case of the United States, new bands would form in the wake of previous bands, which created an extensive underground circuit in America, filled with different scenes in various parts of the country. Although American alternative artists of the 1980s never generated spectacular album sales, they exerted a considerable influence on later alternative musicians and laid the groundwork for their success. On September 10, 1988, an alternative songs chart was created by Billboard, listing the 40 most played songs on alternative and modern rock radio stations in the U.S. The first number one was Susie and the Banshees' Peekaboo. By 1989 the genre had become popular enough that a package tour featuring New Order, Public Image Limited and the Sugar Cubes toured the United States Arena Circuit. In contrast, British alternative rock was distinguished from that of the United States early on by a more pop-oriented focus, marked by an equal emphasis on albums and singles, as well as greater openness to incorporating elements of dance and club culture, and a lyrical emphasis on specifically British concerns. As a result, few British alternative bands have achieved commercial success in the U.S. Since the 1980s alternative rock has been played extensively on the radio in the UK, particularly by disc jockeys such as John Peel, who championed alternative music on BBC Radio 1, Richard Skinner, and Annie Nightingale. Artists that had cult followings in the United States received greater exposure through British national radio and the weekly music press, and many alternative bands had chart success there. Topic. American underground in the 1980s Early American alternative bands such as the Dream Syndicate, the Bongos, 10,000 Maniacs, R.E.M., the Feelies and Violent Femmes combined punk influences with folk music and mainstream music influences. R.E.M. was the most immediately successful, its debut album, Murmur, 1983, entered the top 40 and spawned a number of jangle pop followers. One of the many jangle pop scenes of the early 1980s, Los Angeles' Paisley Underground revived the sounds of the 1960s, incorporating psychedelia, rich vocal harmonies and the guitar interplay of folk rock as well as punk and underground influences such as the Velvet Underground, American indie record labels SST Records, Twin Tone Records, Touch and Go Records, and Discord Records presided over the shift from the hardcore punk that then dominated the American underground scene to the more diverse styles of alternative rock that were emerging. Minneapolis bands Husker Du and The Replacements were indicative of this shift. 
Both started out as punk rock bands, but soon diversified their sounds and became more melodic. Michael Azarad asserted that Husker Du was the key link between hardcore punk and the more melodic, diverse music of college rock that emerged. Azarad wrote, Husker Du played a huge role in convincing the underground that melody and punk rock weren't antithetical. The band also set an example by being the first group from the American indie scene to sign to a major record label, which helped establish college rock as a viable commercial enterprise. By focusing on heartfelt songwriting and wordplay instead of political concerns, the replacements upended a number of underground scene conventions. Azarad noted that, along with REM, the replacements were one of the few underground bands that mainstream people liked. By the late 1980s, the American alternative scene was dominated by styles ranging from quirky alternative pop they might be Giants and Camper Van Beethoven, to noise rock, Sonic Youth, Big Black, The Jesus Lizard, and industrial rock, Ministry, Nine Inch Nails. These sounds were in turn followed by the advent of Boston's Pixies and Los Angeles' Jane's Addiction. Around the same time, the grunge subgenre emerged in Seattle, Washington, initially referred to as the Seattle Sound, until its rise to popularity in the early 1990s. Grunge featured a sludgy, murky guitar sound that synthesized heavy metal and punk rock. Promoted largely by Seattle indie label Sub Pop, grunge bands were noted for their thrift store fashion which favored flannel shirts and combat boots suited to the local weather. Early grunge bands Soundgarden and Mudhoney found critical acclaim in the US and UK, respectively. By the end of the decade, a number of alternative bands began to sign to major labels. While early major label signings Husker Du and The Replacements had little success, acts who signed with majors in their wake, such as REM and Jane's Addiction, achieved gold and platinum records, setting the stage for alternatives' later breakthrough. Some bands such as Pixies had massive success overseas while they were ignored domestically. In the middle of the decade, Husker Du's album Zen Arcade influenced other hardcore acts by tackling personal issues. Out of Washington, D.C.'s hardcore scene, what was called Emo Core or Emo emerged and was noted for its lyrics, which delved into emotional, very personal subject matter, vocalists sometimes cried, and added free association poetry and a confessional tone. Rites of Spring has been described as the first emo band. Former minor threat singer Ian Mackay founded Discord Records which became the center for the city's emo scene. Topic: <laughs> British subgenres and trends of the 1980s. Gothic rock developed out of late 1970s British post-punk with a reputation as the darkest and gloomiest form of underground rock. Gothic rock utilizes a synthesizer and guitar-based sound drawn from post-punk to construct foreboding, sorrowful, often epic soundscapes. And the subgenre's lyrics often address literary romanticism, morbidity, religious symbolism, and supernatural mysticism. Bands of this subgenre took inspiration from two British post-punk groups, Joy Division and Susie and the Banshees. Bauhaus debut single, Bella Lugosi's Dead, released in 1979, is considered to be the proper beginning of the gothic rock subgenre. The Cure's Oppressively Dispirited Albums including Pornography 1982 cemented that group's stature in that style and laid the foundation for its large cult following. The key British alternative rock band to emerge during the 1980s was Manchester's The Smiths. Music journalist Simon Reynolds singled out The Smiths and their American contemporaries REM as the two most important alt rock bands of the day, commenting that they were 80s bands only in the sense of being against the 80s. Reynolds noted that the Smiths' whole stance was predicated on their British audience being a lost generation, exiles in their own land. The Smiths' embrace of the guitar in an era of synthesizer dominated music is viewed as signalling the end of the New Wave era and the advent of alternative rock in the United Kingdom. 
Despite the band's limited chart success and short career, the Smiths exerted an influence over the British indie scene through the end of the decade, as various bands drew from singer Morrissey's English-centred lyrical topics and guitarist Johnny Marr's jangly guitar-playing style. The C86 cassette, a 1986 NME premium featuring Primal Scream, The Wedding Present and others, was a major influence on the development of indie pop and the British indie scene as a whole. Other forms of alternative rock developed in the UK during the 1980s. The Jesus and Mary Chains sound combined the Velvet Underground's melancholy noise with Beach Boys pop melodies and Phil Spector's Wall of Sound. Production, while New Order emerged from the demise of post punk band Joy Division and experimented with techno and house music. The Mary Chain, along with Dinosaur JR, C86, and the dream pop of Cocteau Twins, were the formative influences for the shoegazing movement of the late 1980s. Named for the band members' tendency to stare at their feet and guitar effects pedals on stage rather than interact with the audience, shoegazing acts like My Bloody Valentine and Slow Dive created an overwhelmingly loud wash of sound that obscured vocals and melodies with long, droning riffs, distortion, and feedback. Shoegazing bands dominated the British music press at the end of the decade along with the Manchester scene. Performing for the most part in the Hacienda, a nightclub in Manchester owned by New Order and Factory Records, Manchester bands such as Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses mixed acid house dance rhythms with melodic guitar pop. Topic popularization In the 1990s, by the start of the 1990s, the music industry was enticed by alternative rock's commercial possibilities and major labels had already signed Jane's Addiction, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Dinosaur Jr. In early 1991, REM went mainstream worldwide with Out of Time while becoming a blueprint for many alternative bands. The first edition of the Lollapalooza Festival became the most successful tour in North America in July and August 1991. For Dave Grohl of Nirvana who caught it near Los Angeles in an open-air amphitheater, it felt like something was happening, that was the beginning of it all. The tour helped change the mentalities in the music industry. By that fall, radio and MTV and music had changed. I really think that if it weren't for Perry, Farrell, if it weren't for Lollapalooza, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The release of the Nirvana's single, Smells Like Teen Spirit, in September 1991, marked the instigation of the grunge music phenomenon. Due to constant airplay of the song's music video on MTV, their album Nevermind was selling 400,000 copies a week by Christmas 1991. Its success surprised the music industry. Nevermind not only popularized grunge, but also established the cultural and commercial viability of alternative rock in general. Michael Azarad asserted that Nevermind symbolized a sea change in rock music, in which the hair metal that had dominated rock music at that time fell out of favor in the face of music that was authentic and culturally relevant. The breakthrough success of Nirvana led to the widespread popularization of alternative rock in the 1990s. It heralded a new openness to alternative rock among commercial radio stations, opening doors for heavy alternative bands in particular. In the wake of Nevermind, alternative rock found itself dragged kicking and screaming into the mainstream, and record companies, confused by the genre's success yet eager to capitalize on it, scrambled to sign bands. The New York Times declared in 1993, alternative rock doesn't seem so alternative anymore. Every major label has a handful of guitar-driven bands in shapeless shirts and threadbare jeans, bands with bad posture and good riffs who cultivate the oblique and the evasive, who conceal catchy tunes with noise and hide craftsmanship behind nonchalance. However, many alternative rock artists rejected success, for it conflicted with the rebellious, DIY ethic the genre had espoused before mainstream exposure and their ideas of artistic authenticity. During the middle of the 90s, Alanis Morissette and band had huge success with the album Jagged Little Pill released in 1995. During the same year No Doubt released Tragic Kingdom to wide acclaim and Skunkin' Nancy released the album Paranoid and Sunburnt followed a year later by Stoosh. Topic. Grunge Other grunge bands subsequently replicated Nirvana's success. 
Pearl Jam had released its debut album Ten a month before Nevermind in 1991, but album sales only picked up a year later. By the second half of 1992 Ten became a breakthrough success, being certified gold and reaching number two on the Billboard 200 album chart. Soundgarden's album Bad Motorfinger, Alice in Chains Dirt and Stone Temple Pilots Court along with the Temple of the Dog album collaboration featuring members of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, were also among the 100 top-selling albums of 1992. The popular breakthrough of these grunge bands prompted Rolling Stone to nickname Seattle, the New Liverpool. Major record labels signed most of the prominent grunge bands in Seattle, while a second influx of bands moved to the city in hopes of success. At the same time, critics asserted that advertising was co opting elements of grunge and turning it into a fad. Entertainment Weekly commented in a 1993 article There hasn't been this kind of exploitation of a subculture since the media discovered hippies in the 60s. The New York Times compared the grunging of America," to the mass marketing of punk rock, disco, and hip-hop in previous years. As a result of the genre's popularity, a backlash against grunge developed in Seattle. Nirvana's follow-up album In Utero 1993, was an intentionally abrasive album that Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic described as a wild aggressive sound, a true alternative record. Nevertheless, upon its release in September 1993 in utero topped the Billboard charts. Pearl Jam also continued to perform well commercially with its second album, V.S. which topped the Billboard charts by selling a record 950,378 copies in its first week of release. <laughs> Britpop. With the decline of the Manchester scene and the unglamorousness of shoegazing, the tide of grunge from America dominated the British alternative scene and music press in the early 1990s. As a reaction, a flurry of British bands emerged that wished to get rid of grunge and declare war on America, taking the public and native music press by storm. Dubbed Britpop. By the media, this movement represented by Pulp, Blur, Suede, and Oasis was the British equivalent of the grunge explosion, in that the artists propelled alternative rock to the top of the charts in their home country. Britpop bands were influenced by and displayed reverence for British guitar music of the past, particularly movements and genres such as the British Invasion, glam rock, and punk rock. In 1995 the Britpop phenomenon culminated in a rivalry between its two chief groups, Oasis and Blur, symbolized by their release of competing singles on the same day. Blur won the Battle of Britpop, but Oasis soon eclipsed the other band in popularity with their second album, What's the Story? Morning Glory? 1995, which went on to become the third best-selling album in the UK's history. Topic. Indie rock Long synonymous with alternative rock as a whole in the US, indie rock became a distinct form following the popular breakthrough of Nirvana. Indie rock was formulated as a rejection of alternative rock's absorption into the mainstream by artists who could not or refused to cross over, and a wariness of its macho aesthetic. While indie rock artists share the punk rock distrust of commercialism, the genre does not entirely define itself against that, as the general assumption is that it's virtually impossible to make indie rock's varying musical approaches compatible with mainstream tastes in the first place. Labels such as Matador Records, Merge Records, and Discord, and indie rockers like Pavement, Superchunk, Fugazi, and Sleater Kinney dominated the American indie scene for most of the 1990s. One of the main indie rock movements of the 1990s was lo-fi. The movement, which focused on the recording and distribution of music on low-quality cassette tapes, initially emerged in the 1980s. By 1992 Pavement, guided by Voices and Cibado became popular lo-fi cult acts in the United States, while subsequently artists like Beck and Liz Fair brought the aesthetic to mainstream audiences. The period also saw alternative confessional female singer-songwriters. Besides the aforementioned Liz Fair, PJ Harvey fit into this subgroup. 
Topic: <laughs> Post grunge. During the latter half of the 1990s, grunge was supplanted by post grunge. Many post-grunge bands lacked the underground roots of grunge and were largely influenced by what grunge had become, namely, a wildly popular form of inward-looking, serious-minded hard rock. Many post-grunge bands emulated the sound and style of grunge, but not necessarily the individual idiosyncrasies of its original artists. Post-grunge was a more commercially viable genre that tempered the distorted guitars of grunge with polished, radio-ready production. Originally, post-grunge was a label used almost pejoratively on bands that emerged when grunge was mainstream and emulated the grunge sound. The label suggested that bands labeled as post-grunge were simply musically derivative, or a cynical response to an authentic Rock movement, Bush, Candlebox and Collective Soul were labeled almost pejoratively as post-grunge which, according to Tim Grierson of About.com, is suggesting that rather than being a musical movement in their own right, they were just a calculated, cynical response to a legitimate stylistic shift in rock music. Post-grunge morphed during the late 1990s as post-grunge bands such as Foo Fighters, Creed and Nickelback emerged. Topic: Post rock. Post rock was established by Talk Talk's Laughing Stock and Slint Spiderland albums, both released in 1991. Post rock draws influence from a number of genres, including krautrock, progressive rock, and jazz. The genre subverts or rejects rock conventions and often incorporates electronic music. While the name of the genre was coined by music journalist Simon Reynolds in 1994 referring to Hex by the London group Bark Psychosis, the style of the genre was solidified by the release of Millions Now Living Will Never Die 1996 by the Chicago group Tortoise. Post-rock became the dominant form of experimental rock music in the 1990s and bands from the genre signed to such labels as Thrill Jockey, Cranky, Drag City, and Too Pure. A related genre, math rock, peaked in the mid-1990s. In comparison to post-rock, math rock is more «rockist» and relies on complex time signatures and intertwining phrases. By the end of the decade a backlash had emerged against post-rock due to its «dispassionate intellectuality» and its perceived increasing predictability, but a new wave of post-rock bands such as Godspeed U. Black Emperor and Seeger Ross emerged who further expanded the genre. Other trends In 1993, Smashing Pumpkins' album Siamese Dream was a major commercial success. The strong influence of heavy metal and progressive rock on the album helped to legitimize alternative rock to mainstream radio programmers and close the gap between alternative rock and the type of rock played on American 1970s album-oriented rock radio. In 1995, Smashing Pumpkins also released their double album Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness which went on to sell 10 million copies in the U.S. alone, certifying it as a diamond record. After almost a decade in the underground, ska punk, a mixture of earlier British ska and punk acts, became popular in the United States. Rancid was the first of the third wave ska revival acts to break. In 1996, the Mighty Mighty Bostones, No Doubt, Sublime, Goldfinger, Real Big Fish, Less Than Jake and Save Ferris charted or received radio exposure. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Change in sound. By the end of the decade, alternative rock style changed due to a number of events, notably the death of Nirvana's Kurt Cobain in 1994 and Pearl Jam's lawsuit against concert venue promoter Ticketmaster, which in effect barred the group from playing many major venues around the United States. In addition to the decline of grunge bands, Britpop faded as Oasis' third album, Be Here Now 1997, received lackluster reviews and Blur began to incorporate influences from American alternative rock. A signifier of alternative rock's changes was the hiatus of the Lollapalooza Festival after an unsuccessful attempt to find a headliner in 1998. In light of the festival's troubles that year, Spin said, Lollapalooza is as comatose as alternative rock right now. Despite a change in style, alternative rock still managed to be mainstream. 
Post-grunge remained commercially viable into the start of the 21st century, when bands like Creed and Matchbox 20 became among the most popular rock bands in the United States. At the same time Britpop began to decline, Radiohead achieved critical acclaim with its third album OK Computer 1997, and its follow-ups Kid A 2000 and Amnesiac 2001, which were in marked contrast with the traditionalism of Britpop. Radiohead, along with post-Britpop groups like Travis and Coldplay, were major forces in British rock in subsequent years. In the mid-1990s, Sunny Day Real Estate defined the emo genre. Weezer's album Pinkerton 1996 was also influential. By 2000 and on into the new decade, emo was one of the most popular rock music genres. Popular acts included the sales success of Bleed American by Jimmy Eat World 2001 and Dashboard Confessionals The Places You Have Come to Fear the Most 2003. The new emo had a much more mainstream sound than in the 1990s and a far greater appeal amongst adolescents than its earlier incarnations. At the same time, use of the term, emo, expanded beyond the musical genre, becoming associated with fashion, a hairstyle and any music that expressed emotion. Emo's mainstream success continued with bands emerging in the 2000s, including multi-platinum acts such as Fall Out Boy and My Chemical Romance and mainstream groups such as Paramore and Panic! at the Disco. Topic: 21st Century During the late 1990s and early 2000s, several alternative rock bands emerged, including The Strokes, Franz Ferdinand, Interpol and The Rapture that drew primary inspiration from post-punk and new wave, establishing the post-punk revival movement. Preceded by the success of bands such as The Strokes and The White Stripes earlier in the decade, an influx of new alternative rock bands, including several post-punk revival artists and others such as The Killers, and Yeah Yeah Yeahs, found commercial success in the early and mid-2000s. Owing to the success of these bands, Entertainment Weekly declared in 2004. After almost a decade of domination by rap rock and new metal bands, mainstream alt rock is finally good again. 30 Seconds to Mars experiencing a notable rise in popularity during the latter half of the 2000s. American rock band Red Hot Chili Peppers entered a newfound popularity in 1999 after the release of their album Californication, 1999, with continued success throughout the 2000s. Arctic Monkeys were a prominent act to owe their initial commercial success to the use of internet social networking, with two UK number one singles and Whatever People Say I Am, That's What I'm Not 2006, which became the fastest selling debut album in British chart history. Most references to alternative rock music in the United States past 2010 are to the indie rock genre, a term that previously had limited usage on alternative rock channels and media. Radio stations in the 2010s have been changing formats away from alternative rock, but this is mostly motivated by conglomeration efforts coupled with advertisers seeking more top 40, top 100 stations for sales. While there have been conflicting opinions on the relevance of alternative rock to mainstream audiences beyond 2010, Dave Grohl commented on an article from the December 29, 2013 issue of the New York Daily News stating that rock is dead. Speak for yourself. Rock seems pretty alive to me. Contemporary mainstream alternative rock bands tend to fuse musical elements of hard rock, electronica, hip-hop, indie and punk while placing emphasis on keyboards and guitar. In 2010s, British rock band Muse gained a worldwide recognition with their album The Resistance and Drones which won Grammy Awards. American alternative duo 21 Pilots blurs the lines between genres including hip-hop, emo, rock, indie pop and reggae and has managed to break numerous records. They became the first alternative act to have two concurrent top five singles in the United States while their fourth studio album Blurryface 2015 was the very first album in history to have every song receive at least a gold certification from the Recording Industry Association of America. 21 Pilots also became the very first rock act to have a song reach a billion streams on Spotify. Their breakout hit single, Stressed Out, 
was the 25th song to achieve the rare feat of at least 1 billion plays on the streaming platform. The milestone comes at a time when music genres represented on streaming platforms like Spotify are fairly homogeneous, being dominated by genres such as hip-hop, EDM, and adult contemporary styled pop. See also Adult album alternative radio format Independent music List of alternative rock artists Modern rock radio format Spin alternative record guide Timeline of alternative rock <laughs>